Let's see this. Anybody else hear that? <laughs> no, I guess we're good. Okay. One thing to, to check in on, on sometimes every time someone enters the room, it'll have that recording in progress sort of thing pop up. So we'll see if that happens here. And okay, great. Yeah, good deal. Look, I didn't hear I it again. It, so it looks like we're I good. think it's only happening when to them on their end. Good. Great. Yeah. <laughs> let's give it what time are we into? Uh, all right. Let's give it another minute or just another minute, and then I'll go ahead and do my intro as we gather. All right, I think we are well, let one more person in. There we go. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. It's the top of the hour, no matter what hour it happens to be in your <laughs> neck of the woods. Um, I want to welcome everyone to the fourth in our series of virtual workshops. These are brought to you by IBMA's Leadership Bluegrass Alumni Committee. Uh, my name is Lee Stivers. I'm the co-chair of the Leadership Bluegrass Alumni Committee and working with committee members and, and uh, this year's members of this year's newly minted Leadership Bluegrass uh, class. Um, this is actually going to be the final session in our series this winter. We were working on another session for May, but because of some speaker availability issues, we're going to have to bump that into the next season. Um, we are recording this, of course, and we're working on getting the recordings of this year's four uh, in the series posted to our Leadership Bluegrass website, Leadership Bluegrass alumni website, so watch for details on that. Um, before I turn this over to Annie Savage to, to introduce today's workshop and speakers, I'm going to just encourage people to use the chat uh, the comment section to put in comments and questions, and we'll get to those as we go. Um, and with that, Annie, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Lee. I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you all today. We've got some glitterati bluegrass educators both on the panel and in the house. So welcome, everybody. Um, I am Annie Savage, and I'm the founder of the Free Strings Method, a comprehensive online curriculum for public school teachers to use to teach the popular styles of bluegrass, blues, jazz, and world music in their programs. I'm also on the Leadership Bluegrass Planning Committee and the recipient of the 2020 IBMA Mentor of the Year Award for my work in bringing bluegrass to schools, festival, and associations. Our panel today is Greg Cahill, Austin Skeltso, and Giselle Aboat, and we are thrilled to have them with us. We also have some members of the Leadership Bluegrass Planning Committee. Welcome, Dr. Laney, and um, the Executive Director of the IBMA Foundation, Nancy Cardwell, with us today. The work that we're going to explore today began with a dialogue between a dedicated team of bluegrass educators that included Greg Cahill, Austin Skelso, uh, Jordan Laney, Natal, Nancy Cardwell, and I, along with many other um, sage bluegrass educators, kind of lineage holders. Uh, this was predicated by a town hall where Austin did um, some really pioneering work in desi desiring to put a community of bluegrass educators together in one place. And I want to give him a big shout out for that. Um, in these discussions, we noted that so much work had preceded us and that in many cases where we were looking to incorporate bluegrass into the traditional model of public school, um, we were attempting to reinvent the wheel. Um, Nancy Cardwell then provided a pamphlet that Greg Cahill and others had put together to help bands provide outreach to public schools and for interested public schools to access funding to host bands and blues, bluegrass educators in their classrooms and in their school bodies. As a member of the Leadership Bluegrass Planning Committee and moderator of the Leadership Bluegrass Education Panel, I noted that a revision of this pamphlet, which is in the chat so that you can access that as we go through today, and the IBMA Foundation resources page, which is also in the chat as a link, um, would 
be uh, an interesting place to start with the addition of more inclusive and culturally relevant resources, and that we could then help schools and bands continue a relationship. The revision of the content of both the pamphlet and the IBMA Foundation resources page became the work of the Leadership Bluegrass class of 2023. We have two members of this class here today to discuss these recommendations and moreover their experience with bluegrass education in public schools, as well as the OG bluegrass educator <laughs> who has performed in front of an estimated 5 million public school students today, um, Greg Cahill. And Greg is long, long a beloved Midwesterner in the house, uh, um, un, a person who has understood the value of education, both on the band side and to outreach in the public schools. And um, in a minute, I'm going to introduce him. He'll be our first speaker. Um, we hope to have about five to 10 minutes from each panelist. And then Nancy's going to tell us. Um, all about what the foundation can offer schools and bands and performers alike. And then we'll have a group discussion where we hope to hear from some of you. If you have any questions, throw them in the chat and we'll try to get to them as they come up. Uh, our first speaker, Greg Cahill, created the Special Consensus Traditional American Music Program that included a complete printed program overview and in-school presentation outline for teachers in 1984. And Special C still brings this presentation to schools for K through 12 through college level students nationally and internationally. Five million kids is a lot, Greg. <laughs> As the IBMA Bluegrass in the Schools Committee Chair from 1998 to 2004, Greg helped create the BGIS Educational Resource Guide and with Nancy Cardwell created the BGIS Implementation Manual, um, which is the document that you'll see in the chat we're starting to um, revise and was co-executive producer of the Discover Bluegrass video project with Nancy. Greg was also a member of the IBMA Board of Directors from 1998 to 2010. Wow, mad props. Serving as vice chair from 2004 to 2006 and board chair president from 2006 to 2010. Greg Cahill, um, will you tell us about the original intent of the Bluegrass in the Schools pamphlet and how this has impacted your work with your career band, Special Consensus. Um, you are like a lineage holder for us. And if you would share with us the institutional knowledge um, of your work so that we do not have to reinvent these wheels and can instead just align with the great work that you've already done. Well, thanks for that great introduction, Annie. I think I, I got two things out of that. One is I must really be old. And the other thing, I think it's closer to a million kids, maybe not 5 million, <clears throat> but we actually did a study of that for uh, Wayne Bledsoe when he had uh, the Bluegrass Now publication, and that was years ago, but it was about a million. But anyway, I think the, the, the biggest thing for us, um, well, first of all, the whole concept started with just a friend, a teacher friend saying, hey, would you come in and play the banjo because a lot of kids haven't seen the banjo. And of course, that's way pre-internet, so that's not an issue today. Kids know, um, you know, a lot of the instruments or have at least seen them. But the biggest, uh, I think, uh, turning point was when the teachers, other teachers, you know, wanted us to come in. And in fact, I would go in with Chris Jones, who was our guitar player at the time. And uh, there was such interest in this as, as an educational experience and not just an entertainment experience. And I think that was the key. So then... Um, going to the library because it was pre-internet and writing up just an overview uh, of what bluegrass music is about was very helpful both for teachers to prepare the classes for uh, us to come in and do the presentation but also for fundraising um, and that was a big thing i would mention that uh, for the fundraising for these programs, uh, one thing that was really uh, interesting was that, uh, you know, as you drive into a different, the different towns, I don't know if it's as prevalent today as it was then, but they oftentimes have a list of the community organizations. And um, we would uh, write those down 
because the Kiwanis Club or the Lions Club or the veterans, whatever, uh, oftentimes are looking for a place to make an impact in the community and to give something back to the community. And what better way than to say, hey, why don't you help support us going into these schools, you know, or a school, whatever. So that is a, is a side point, but in addition to the federal and state grants that you've mentioned, and by the way, I think the work that you all have done already in a relatively short period of time, just revising the, the, uh, the materials and, and the concepts is great, you know, right on track. So that's a great thing The all the states, well, I don't know if they all do now, but they would have, uh, like in Illinois, they have the arts tour roster and, and you have to apply to be on the roster and it's, you know, for all types of entertainment, music and dance and theater and what have you. But uh, it's good because then they can offer a, a good percentage, maybe up to 20% of whatever fee you charge. Um, and that's a big thing. But uh, it does go back to grassroots, I think. Um, what It's always helpful if you know a teacher or have a teacher who uh, is interested or who knows bluegrass music, especially. Um, and, and it's very helpful in the schools to have somebody like that talk to the principal or whatever and it might make the difference between going to a classroom or an entire assembly of a thousand kids in the gym you know um and having a a, a set program uh i i noticed you're, you're revising some of the materials the implementation manual was was meant to just give an idea of what the program would be like and list an actual you know possible program presentation but uh, I think the key is having enough information to make it an educational experience, but not too much information because then people get just kind of like, well, that's that's a lot of stuff to, to give to my kids, you know. So I think uh, that's another factor. And I don't know if it if it would make a difference or not, but we called it the bluegrass in the schools and not bluegrass in the public schools, because interestingly enough, oftentimes. The Catholic schools, the Protestant schools, they had the money right away to have us go in, you know, and they didn't ask anybody for the money and they would they would say, OK, yes, let's do a program. Let's do it for the whole group. And you had, you know, you didn't have to worry about fundraising most of the time. I, I just removed public from the <laughs> document because I thought we can be equal opportunity employer in this day of voucher systems. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really, really, you know, the, the private schools oftentimes are, are much more, they have funding for that built in, you know, and of course the things mentioned in, in the materials that, that you've made available, uh, the, the PTO, the PTA, um, and as I said, a lot of the community clubs and organizations, and, um, and then some schools will just uh, fundraise on their own and just say, hey, you know, we want to bring in some, some music or the biggest thing is that this is an educational presentation in addition to something that the kids can enjoy and involving the kids, which I, you know, you, you built into the materials. So I um, love this. Thank you. I just dropped a, some corporate level foundations and scholarships that um, also folks can access. Um, Greg, I have a probing question because we have two stakeholders in this discussion and one is what do public school students get from this kind of work and how do we get in there but i think an interesting point in your career is the fact that you've had a long time running band um could we pivot and talk about what bands get from this what performers get from this because as a performer myself who was on the road kind of dashing in and out of festivals working really hard on the weekends and then trying to compensate with sleep and self-care during the week. Um, I think public schools have a very friendly, and schools in general, to your point, have a very friendly schedule. Um, it's a it's a safe place. It's a sober place. It's a, um, it's a sane place that you can provide service. Could you talk about how work in the public schools benefited the band and the health of its members in that? Yeah, well, I think it uh, it certainly reaffirms your com personal commitment to growing the, the, the world of bluegrass music, you know, and to bringing in more young people. But uh, oftentimes, very often, we would uh, parlay an afternoon presentation in the community 
of where we were going to perform that evening. So it would also, it was very fulfilling to see, um, especially the, the K through eight or even 12, uh, the, the younger folks just, just really, the light bulb went on like, wow, this is really something cool. And they don't even plug these things in, holy cow, you know, and they can sing together and have fun. And I don't know, I, I, I just think it, uh, it made you feel like, you know, maybe this is a good thing to do, <laughs> you know, and to bring this to the community and to the kids and um, what a great way for that was always our message too. look what a great way to spend time with your friends you know you get together and you play music how cool is that and uh, and you can even study it then in school and, and, and you can you know it could be a career uh, but I think it was just very rewarding uh, personally it, it brought the band together um, the team spirit you know was was enhanced um and and uh i think it 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 was good to, to feel like you, you're br really bringing something to the community because uh, you know we would have things like well now listen we're, we're, we're doing a concert tonight so if you come with your folks be sure you come up to the to the record table which you know <laughs> it was called a record table then not merch table but you know come up with your parents and we'd love to meet you and see your family you know and uh uh, and the teachers then, we would encourage them to, to, well, that's why we developed the written materials that we would send in advance so that they could prep the students for that. But then they would ask the students to write something after. And we just, I've got, I've got a file cabinet full of the letters from the kids, you know, like, uh, I like the banjo a lot because it's loud. And my favorite instrument is the bass because it's big and, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. But I mean, there were very, in other words, it was, it was very universally, uh, I think, enhancing to, to, to just a good feeling about music, about school, uh, uh, about entertainment, about family stuff. And, and it was all right there. You know? I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, it, it uh, band members uh, really appreciated it because, you know, they just, there was a great sense of accomplishment, I think, uh, the more we did it. Um, it was like, wow, this is, you know, we really are uh, spreading the bluegrass word. You know? Yeah, I know um, our great friend and mentor, Pete Wernick, says that when he gets an opportunity um, presented to him, he says, first of all, is it good for bluegrass? And mm -hmm. second of all, is it good for me? And so that service piece just um, operates two ways, right? It helps us to help them. And um, I certainly, from a third person perspective, would observe that your band has stayed together um, and that it, as a fellow performer, that's like the holy grail. Just let these people stay together and let us keep doing this um, of work. So I have so much respect for you. Um, do you mind if we jump in and have a look at the new pamphlet real quick and then we'll continue down our road? Yeah, I think that'd be great. And I think you've done a great job, all the key points. Um, and just enhance that the and 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 it's relatively i mean it's it's kind of brief to not brief but i mean there's a fine line between too much information and too little and i think you've i think you've done it so i think it's great well we appreciate your blessing and we really appreciate the fact that a lot of this was copy and paste <laughs> <laughs> um, from the original document, which was uh, obviously a more extensive document, our great hope um, and work in the class leadership bluegrass class of 2023, which our panelists will talk more is really um, ended up uh, centering around the online resources that we were able to provide, right? Because as you pointed out, we didn't have um, any kind of virtual platform there. So the pamphlet is abbreviated to really serve as an introduction into um, the idea of hosting bands at the school level or to go out to schools at the performer level. And then um, a lot of these resources will then be shared through the IBMA Foundation. And so the class Leadership Bluegrass class of 2023 took this idea and um, compiled revisions and lists, very valuable lists of resources. Our um, class member who's not with us today, Brandy Waller-Pace, who is um, the founder of Decolonizing the Music Room, did a great job of bringing in some resources of bands and performers 
Um, and we're busy going through those lists and turn those resources over to Nancy and the foundation. Um, and, and we have this beautiful physical pamphlet that we'd love to share with you. You can get your own copy in the chat and um, download it as you would like. Um, I just wanted to highlight a couple things and then we'll pivot to our uh, next presenter. I had to make a little mock-up of this. Go ahead. But I, I just want to say one other thing, which is I think it would be really good. Uh, we should also emphasize that the bands should fully immerse themselves in this information because now, of course, they're, they're a little more sophisticated with presentations, but uh, it's not just a matter of going in and playing some bluegrass music for the kids, which uh, I think the more informed uh, the bands are, the, the people going in to make the presentation, the better that is. So that seems like an obvious thing, but sometimes um, that uh, wasn't always the case, let's just say. So I think it's real important that they also know the material as much as what they're hoping the teachers will know when they send the implementation manual. Absolutely. And I am um, a shameless self-promotion moment here <laughs> that you beautifully segued into. Um, that was that was my concern as a performer who was doing clinics in public schools, that what do they do before I get there and what do they do afterwards and how do I pivot this away from performing at the students to actually performing with the students. And if anybody is interested um, at the band level in having your very own curriculum that you can send ahead of time, um, then the free strings method is a great option. And it actually provides notation for all of the melodies backups because a lot of public schools um, are used to reading notation. And so there was this point in my career where I said, I wanna do it by ear, like this beautiful upbringing that I had with mentors. Um, but there was, we were getting lost in translation and a mentor of mine said, why don't you just give everything to them? So um, if there are bands out there looking for an easy to apply curriculum, um, I'm happy to talk to you. And I did drop it in the chat. Um, the 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 money is there this is a really good um piece to running all of this through uh the ibma foundation these grants are available so bands can apply to um, the bluegrassfoundation.org mini grants and a great point um that we found in jeff scroggins in colorado was that you can route to a festival. So if you have an anchor gig out on the West Coast and you're on the East Coast, you can use the public school um, routing system, which is where you book yourself in schools to get to the festival that weekend. And um, these mini grants are available to do that. This is really a pamphlet that is designed for anybody from a performer to a clinician, to those local stakeholders, like Greg pointed out, the Kiwanis, the vets clubs, um, churches, uh, organizations, PTOs that wanna see bluegrass in the schools. We were uh, given some beautiful uh, images from the archives of the IBMA Foundation. I had to make myself a little map so that when you fold this up, you know how the pages appear and in what order, but this is the cover right here. In the second page, um, we outline bringing bluegrass and American roots music to the schools. Um, that gives you some uh, links to the resource page. We'll put, plan to put a QR code on this as we get it rounded out. Um, and we abbreviated bluegrass music, the roots. One thing that public schools um, are really answering to right now is um, equity and inclusiveness. And so we want to make sure that our school friends know that bluegrass is for anyone. Um, and we've got a panelist here who has really lived that, done it. Annie Beach is here um, and has curated the jam pack. And um, they're up here in our images. There are so many beautiful stories of diverse bodies of learners distilling down to those three chords and the truth and being able to make music um, in any budget. So uh, we point that out in the roots. Um, bluegrass is truly an American form of music that is highly accessible to public school students. We give a bit of funding information and um, 
that is the pamphlet as it stands. And we hope that everybody here, feel free to contribute resources in the chat. That's a list that we're compiling. So if you say, hey, I know somebody who does bluegrass fun, you know, um, clinic work, and maybe they're not, maybe these folks don't have them down, put it in the chat, we'll grab those. And um, so that is the pamphlet. Feel free to use, disseminate, share with your public school communities, share with your bandmates. And um, I'm going to stop my share lest I give away all the secrets here. <laughs> um, and I'm going to send things over to uh, a person of great interest in the bluegrass education world. He's just a fire starter, very dynamic performer, very dynamic uh, person of interest in the bluegrass education world. Also, mad shout out to the folks who start associations. And he is also the founder of the Connecticut Bluegrass Association, which is great. Um, Austin Skelzo, after serving in public schools as uh, a public school orchestra director, Austin decided to take a big risk in transitioning from a creative orchestra teacher to musical entrepreneur. This decision followed his growing love for bluegrass music and desire to serve and provide resources to that community. He founded the Kinetic Connecticut Bluegrass Association, uh, which is so valuable, um, which seeks to promote bluegrass bands, education, jams, festivals, and event venues in and around Connecticut. Austin still visits schools as a clinician, prevents at professional development sessions, and shares resources for public school teachers to incorporate non-traditional approaches to education on YouTube and in his blog. Um, I had the good fortune of working with Austin in the class of 2023, of which he was a very valuable member. And Austin um, facilitated a conversation around how the wide tent model of bluegrass education and outreach are connected. I'm gonna give the floor to Austin Skelto. Well, thank you so much, Annie. Thank you for that uh, introduction. I appreciate that so much. And, and I just appreciate uh, the opportunity to share some of the findings that the Leadership Bluegrass Class of 2023 uh, put together for you. Our task was sort of twofold. One of them was to compile a list of suggestions and possible barriers for new audiences to bluegrass music, which was originally for younger, we were originally targeting just young people, but then we realized we just kind of expanded this idea of bringing new audiences to bluegrass music. So I'd like to share with you the findings of the, the Leadership Bluegrass Class of 2023 in that presentation, and also highlight some of the uh, resources that we were compiled in a conversation around the uh, implementing bluegrass music in the schools program. So a lot of these, like Annie mentioned, are were resources that were out there in the world, but maybe were are in outdated formats, for example, you know, in DVD form and, and things like that, or they were just, you know, out there and not kind of properly promoted. Uh, and so I'd like to also share some of those findings with you, uh, mostly through uh, a sharing of of the my screen here. So let me just pull this up. The first thing I'd like to share is this incredible resource that has been available to us for many, uh, many years now. Um, this is Discover Bluegrass, which is originally a DVD series that uh, was a part of the resources in the original manual. Uh, you know, you have a listed document of check out this DVD. Well, only as of less than two years ago, this was compiled and transferred into uh, YouTube format. So these these videos are all publicly available online right now, and they're just incredible resources that feature some of our young musicians like AJ Lee and Sierra Hole. Some of these musicians talk about what bluegrass music is like to them today. And so this first video in the series here focuses on that. This second one is a video presentation about the roots of bluegrass music that's available through this. Again, these are all you know, public YouTube videos that are going to be available uh, through the IBMA Foundation uh, page uh, as a, a link from the document to resources for teachers and, and musicians. Next one is uh, a continuation history, of the early, early bluegrass music, growth and expansion, second generation, third generation bluegrass music. There's a great presentation on singing, bluegrass harmony, uh, trio, duo, and quartet singing a fantastic introduction for the instruments, which I can say from my public school experience is very, very, very important. 
there hasn't been one school I've walked into with a mandolin or a banjo where it the the instruments have been recognized by either the students or the teachers. It's just in the Northeast, especially in areas where this music is not as as prevalent or culturally re relevant, uh, this sort of video is, can be really important. And obviously for all the fiddlers out there, you know how many times you've been asked the question, how is a violin different than a fiddle? <laughs> so there's uh, a great uh, answer there. And then finally, there is a, a, a some a conclusion video here that again can include some of the thoughts of our you know young bluegrass musicians today so this is a great resource that is now only recently now available to uh, share on the ibma foundation page and something we wanted to highlight as a bluegrass leadership class as a resource another resource only recently made available is this one here this is a uh, the cba california bluegrass association's presentation in 2021 at the award show. And it is probably the best resource we have today for highlighting diversity of both age, ethnicity, uh, and ability level, which I think is really important. We do have videos online of, of the uh, really high performing bluegrass musicians from Kids on Bluegrass. This one is of just a big wide net for all the way more accurately represents, I think, what an average public school is capable of uh, of, of creating today. So this this re it resource is really, really important. Byron Burlock. Let me make sure the sound is getting to you all right here. I know I can make that uh, optimized for video. There we go. You see, we can see high school students, middle school students, elementary. Age. They're singing and improvising. Solos on different instruments. Young and old. This is a collaboration with Kimber, yes, Kimber Ludiker and Dini Richardson were the main people involved in this project. And it was prevented li uh, presented live at the 2021 award show. So I want to draw attention to that resource. I think it's a, a very, very important one in, in getting schools aware of what this music looks like and to realize that their students can be a part of it. Next resource I want to draw attention to, we, we're focusing on one of the things that uh, we were focusing on is, is as a public school teacher, I know that a big barrier to bringing a workshop like this or bringing a bluegrass band to a school is just fear of an uncertainty. It's, un, it's not knowing what the students will think. It's not knowing what the program will look like. And so one of the ways that we can really make feel, teachers feel at ease is not only showing them what this looks like, having some good examples, video examples of what that looks like, um, but also, uh, getting feedback from students, getting, you know, uh, some examples of the students interacting with bands. So there's two videos I wanted to highlight really quickly there. Uh, one here is actually of Greg Cahill and Special Consensus. This is a great little presentation uh, of American Blue Kid and Bluegrass Blue the Schools, Blue just a sampler. <laughs> great, great quick way of sharing what it looks like. We're going to talk about music. <laughs> We're going to introduce the instrument. And we're going to have discussion. You'll hear some it's questions like from the audience. Music or something that old people might really, you know, a, a casual conversation in the audience. Here. It's like so that's a great example of a video that would set a teacher's mind at ease. Another example of this. This is a uh, I want to highlight the fact that the IBMA Foundation has grants that are available, and this was this was a, a grant project showing students what it's like like to to not uh, to play without sheet music, demonstrating instruments. performing uh, with a group of instruments, talking about singing and playing. Having a band accompany the orchestra. this is a, something that uh, some performances have or some programs around the country are doing this regularly.
And then this is a very important one, getting a sense for what the students think, right? So no, not only the teachers look know what it's going to look like, but they understand that the students are going to respond to it positively. Right, so you get both, you get both perspectives there. Really important. Final thing I'd like to share with you here is the panel, the panel that we did on introducing new audiences to bluegrass music. So that's the main goal here. Uh, let's see, sorry here. So just uh, some some of these, this is going to be presented in more detail when we uh, do a presentation at this upcoming masterclass at the uh, World of Bluegrass in Raleigh. But just to kind of mention some of the things that came up here that I think are really applicable to the, the people in this call right now is uh, the barriers, young and old, uh, for people to get into bluegrass music and some potential solutions that uh, we can get more new people involved in the door. So this is probably one of the most important I wanted to highlight here is there are education systems that are adopting vernacular music in their programs. For example, jazz music. There are, if you sign up for band in many parts of the world, you will be in jazz band. And that is a, a significant a significant advance in including American music in the schools, right? As opposed to where it's been traditionally focused, which is in the choral, especially in orchestra setting, where we're focused on European classical music. So this is a huge step forward. Unfortunately, we don't see that in, in the in inclusivity of bluegrass and string band music, but there's an incredible potential there. Uh, this is often the case, especially in areas where people's families are not connected to uh, bluegrass music so i.e the northeast very very common it's just not a part of the uh, culture so that's a that's a big barrier for people uh, you'll see some other he here other points here i'll try to highlight the ones that are specific to kind of the education world so let's see families getting young people and, and families involved in festivals and things like that often it could be prohibitive if, if you have to pay for every individual student. This is a big part of why I think the CBA video is very important because the intimidation factor of extreme uh, virtuosity in the genre can keep young people from feeling like they have a place. Of course, this is a, uh, a factor in we've which hopefully we're addressing with the funding and some possible solutions. Now, part of the IBMA Foundation, you'll see a, a link to teacher training, which we're gonna, I think we plan on, on putting more of those and also having some examples of past teacher trainings or some uh, links on the IBMA Foundation page that will include that. This is another big movement forward. This is a suggestion, it's already happening. IBMA Foundation is becoming a hub for all this information that we're talking about. Let's see some other examples here. We've talked about inclusivity and showing examples of diversity in the bluegrass world. This is a huge area that we can leverage. Young musicians like Billy Strings and Molly Tuttle, if we keep um, leveraging the audiences that we already have from those and connecting them to uh, connecting, getting kids in schools to hear these artists and things like that can be an easy, easy bridge. We talked about diversity of age. This is a big improvement in, uh, or, or there's some, a lot of great material that Jordan uh, Laney has included of, of the history inclu uh, being inclusive of the er er earlier contributions of musicians. It's a big part of getting more students involved in schools. We talked in general about festivals, targeting young families, getting uh, supporting kids academies. We mentioned the Roots Music Story, early bluegrass music. Instrument loaning programs came up a lot, getting instruments in students' hands. Family passes, family discounts, you heard me mention that. Getting associations to not just promote kids' families' activities, but also have videos and easily accessible 21st century sorts of things. Let's see if there's any others here. This is a uh, this came up a lot having other, you know, not just hot jams at these festivals, but having more family inclusive uh, programs like group folk singing or songwriting, 
or even non-musical activities at festivals that can involve families free concerts at school systems or using grants to help fund those and then offering those students to come to the uh come to the shows or either give them you know uh, complimentary tickets or encourage them to attend the show that weekend talked about the history and accessibility of the music getting kids to perform at local festival stages or at uh, open mics and in the public getting the the music in front of people talent shows another way to do that Uh, this is a, a program that the Floyd Country Store employed to, to get uh, more money flowing into uh, giving uh, to getting young audiences there. So when people buy a ticket, they're offered the opportunity to donate one to five dollars to the Share the Music program, which uh, is helps young families and people who can't afford to go to these programs uh, get into that. We mentioned this before. You're going to hear more from Jam and Jam Pack or about Jam Pack from Giselle. I'm very excited to hear about that. After school activities came up. This is a very important one. When I was teaching online during the pandemic, the Army Navy uh, band came in and did a free presentation for the band students. Well, there is an Army and Navy bluegrass band that can do just the same, provide these uh, things at no cost. So if we can promote that sort of thing, that would be very helpful. You might see. I, here today of the hen house prowlers they created this bluegrass ambassadors program to help uh, raise money for these same school vis visits and of course we heard from greg today uh, on special consensus's amazing work i uh, hope you i want to you know wrap it up there and I, I i hope you found something uh, interesting or intriguing about that i, I wanted <laughs> to compress it in as short a time as i could but um i just appreciate so much for you listening Awesome. Thank you so much, Austin. And I, it would be great if you have the chance to drop a link to that in the chat. That way, anybody who saw something that they were like, wait, I want to know more about this, um, can access that information. And then as we get information on the class of 2020, 20, uh, 2023 panel at Leadership Bluegrass, We'll all look forward to attending and supporting um, what was dangerously close to the greatest leadership bluegrass class of all time. <laughs> <laughs> funny. Funny. Um, all right. Well, I love um, your approach of identifying barriers and then finding a solution, matching barriers with solutions and navigating those barriers. I, our next panelist, who is also um, a contributing member of the class of 2023, as well as I uh, want to give a little shout out to I see other members of the class of 2023 showing up in solidarity. I see Kevin Slick over here in the house. And if there's anybody else in the class that I'm overlooking or not um, seeing, please make yourselves known. Um, Giselle Abo, we are so happy to have you with us today. Thank you for being with us. Um, Giselle is a member of Jam Pack Band and has been part of the Jam Pack family since 1999. She's from Chandler, Arizona, and works professionally as a certified financial paraplanner and portfolio administrator. Giselle is a lifelong music enthusiast, playing harp and flute, working on the banjo, claw hammer style, and dobro. Um, Giselle, wow. Um, I'm so excited to have you here. And we've got mentor Annie Beach, who founded Jam Pack. Um, and... Um, in a world of barriers and a world of, of need, um, here we have this incredible program that came together from a place of love, inclusivity, and bluegrass, and is one of the uh, big um, victories of bluegrass education of our time. Um, can you tell us about your experience with Jam Pack? Um, how does it serve as a roadmap for bluegrass outreach? What can we learn from it? How outreach can impact a community and change lives and anything else that you can share with us about your experience in Jam Pack. Thank you so much for your introduction, Annie. And I'm really happy to be here and to just to, to help so, lend a voice to, to all of us out there who got introduced to this music. Um, by Annie Beach, who founded Jam Pack. So 
Um, and so what I'm going to do, I'll talk a little bit about my experience, and then I will talk about JAMPAC as a, as a, as a roadmap for bluegrass outreach, and then I'll, I'll, I'll conclude um, with how that outreach impacts communities and changes lives just based on what what I've experienced and others uh, shared experiences with, you know, through JAMPAC and this program. So for myself, and um, this, the idea here is simplicity. Um, and it starts with the overarching motto for JAMPAC, which is basically making people happy with our music and you know, from that, good things flow. And that is how I got introduced to the music. Mrs. Beach, and who, well, you know, Annie Beach, Mrs. Beach is how I call her, yes. <laughs> always, um, served as a substitute teacher at a local elementary school. And my sister happened to be in the class that day and Mrs. Beach had brought instruments into the classroom. And Joelle, my sister, got up there and played. And Miss Beach said, I thought there was something there. And so she in invited her out to play. And she became a part of Jam Pack. And that's how I also got to know Mrs. Beach and then got plugged into the Jam Pack family. And so from that, I want to just segue into saying, what we need to do is just expose, when it comes to outreach, expose our children to the, the music, but also involve them in it. And it's simple. The key to with this is that we have to have a center of motivation, right? Why are we doing this? Why, are, why do we want communities? Why do we have communities? And so when you look at it, at the end of the day, it's about that shared experience, right? Mm -hmm. And it's about treating people with love and kindness. So if you go out there, first of all, with an openness and just the fact that we're playing music to have that shared experience and to enjoy our experience in this life together, that will go far. So then when it comes to, to, to kids and outreach with bluegrass, a couple of pointers. So with Jam Pack, it started simply. The kids started out playing canjos that, you know, they made canjos. So we've talked about, we, we know about banjos and, and, and fiddles and bass, but these were canjos that were made for kids just to play because the key that what I've seen with Jam Pack is, is uh, and what we do well, is when we have those festivals, or even if we're going to a park or we have a camping event, we bring along instruments so that kids can touch those instruments, so that kids can play those instruments. And you see their eyes light up. And she invites kids to, you know, it's not just our kids who get to do that, because when other kids see other children playing with these instruments, they go, they, they look like me and they're having fun and I wanna try that too. And so they get a chance to go and touch those instruments. And that is the source of, of, of them also just building that, that awareness and that love for music and playing. So that the, the, the first thing is just that access to the instruments. And then, you, you know, cause a lot of kids also, they may have seen, but they probably never touched it. Right. And so then the other part of it is we have to be open to just just ask, just ask schools. A lot of schools are looking for ways to in, to, to basically inject new things into their programs. For instance, um, Fair Black Rose, that is an offshoot from Jam Pack because Jam Pack has created, a, a, you know, from Jam Pack has grown out of it a lot of different bands that the kids co-create themselves. And when Fair Black Rose was invited out to the IBMA uh, uh, Bluegrass Festival, they made sure that they had a program that they were playing music each day. And one of that was they reached out to the local schools and said, hey, would you like us to play for you? And 
they were all very open. So while they were at the festival, they played at the festival, but they also got to play for schools. And again, the kids were so excited. And from that, you know, I think we can tend to overthink and think, okay, I need to go and go put on this 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 splashy performance or something like that, get every little thing right, every note right, but we forget that at the end of the day, people just want to hear music and enjoy music. And that's what kids, um, that's that's what excites them. And that's that's really all they're interested in. They're not listening to wrong notes or which keys and whatnot. They just want to hear. And, and when they see something where it's people, it's kids like them playing it, it really excites them. And so Fair Black Rose went and played for this school. And out of that, you get the little girls, the little boys coming up to Fair Black Rose and, and, and asking them about the instruments. You start hearing them go, oh, I want to play that. Or even if they don't want to play, they just heard something that was that was was new and different and exciting for them and with, with kids like them playing it. So it's also what Jam Pack does best is also being open about all skill levels too. So I talked about Fair Black Rose that is an offshoot from Jam Pack, but Jam Pack in itself, when they go out and perform, it's all skill levels. It's not a, oh, you couldn't get this chord right, so you can't be in this, uh, you know, or you can't play in this. They Everyone plays, everyone sings, and that feeling of inclusiveness and that feeling of openness goes far because ultimately the goal is just that love of music, right? And so as far as community building, um, again, a community for, for what Jam Pack has created has always been about just sharing music so that we can have that shared love and experience for life, which is what we, we I think we all as human beings are looking for, right? And when we, when Jam Pack puts together programs, it's not about this big production of events. You have to think about it as living life and then making sure that music is a part of your life when, when you do that. And that's how we do it in Jam Pack. If we're having a dinner, sit down, guess what instruments are out and they're around, we'll sit and we'll talk and then we play we play music. Um, if they're out at a festival, yes, those that's a that's a form that we are all really familiar with and we'll bring instruments along, not only perform, but again, have that petting zoo so that you can invite people from the community to come in there and play. And then you get from that, you get conversations, you get talks about life experiences, including the music, but also life experience. You build friendships, you build relationships, because we all know at the end of the day too with life, you've got to have purpose, right? There's got to be a purpose for life. And ultimately, I believe, and we believe at Jam Pack, it's about the relationships in life. And what I have seen with this is when you have a platform like that, and you just have a setting where people can can be themselves and feel themselves and it's all about just love and music you have a situation where kids they do get that opportunity to perform so that they can get those actionable skill sets um in life that help them go far so speaking skills public speaking and then relationship building skills because you can be as technically able as you want in a lot of things in life, but if you cannot connect to another human being and know how to communicate, you won't get very far, right? Or if you get far, your life won't be as fulfilling. So it's it's it teaches those kids that because I've seen children who were very, you know, um, very within themselves blossom, really just blossom. Um, from, from being in a community where they're able to play music and, and interact with a lot of, with a diverse community. And Jam Pack is diverse. We're talking racially, we're talking, you know, sex, boys, girls, we're talking adults. Um, so it's it's across the board, it's very diverse. Um, and but one final point I want to make is that uh, you know, in all of this, um, the history is also key, right? 
I think we have to remember, and we do this in JAMPAC to remind everyone that bluegrass is for all of us. Um, and it is a, a music genre that is has a lot of fingers from a diff, a lot of uh, like contribution from a lot of different parts of the world that came together to make it the quintessential American genre that it is. Because for us to be able to be able to widen that tent, people have to see themselves in the music. Okay, and if they're going to see themselves in the music, they have to feel like they contributed to it too. And so we have to talk about that part of the, the music and emphasize that so it doesn't only look that way so that they can begin to see the fact that, hey, I, I, I definitely have ownership to this music too. I'm a part of it. They can see themselves in it. So that comes with race, that comes with, with age, that comes with gender. And we do that well in jam pack. And and so and it impacts kids in the way that, you know, when they end up in, in schools, they're successful uh, because a lot of our communities, too, as well, that we 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 dealt with are are not, they don't always have all the resources. But from being in this program, they have been able to build and do better from themselves because they have gained skills that help them to be successful. Thank you so much, Giselle. And Annie, since you're here, thank you so much for the work that you've done to lead the way. Bluegrass is for all of us. We love you. We've got Dave Gooding in the house from the California Bluegrass Association. I want to give you a mad shout out as well, Dave. Class of 2023, dang near the greatest class of all time. Hey, good morning. <laughs> thank you for all the work you guys have done. I want to thank all of the panelists, and I want to thank each of you who are here for giving of your time, your spirit, your honesty, your candor, and your love for the music. I want to wrap things up by introducing Nancy Cardwell, who is um, a person of great interest and opportunity for each of us, and um, will share some of the resources that as members of IBMA, we can access through the IBMA Foundation. And Nancy, um, I'm going to let you jump right in because we're almost out of time. Nancy has been a lineage holder as well, serving on the IBMA staff from 1994 to 2015. Can we just give her the mad props for that? <laughs> instrumental in working with the committees that created Bluegrass in the schools and Leadership Bluegrass, 2000 year grad of Leadership Bluegrass. Nancy is a career artist and has worked professionally for many organizations, but most of all is um, the lineage holder in so many ways for the work that IBMA does. And um, Nancy, can we turn it over to you to tell us about finding solutions to the barriers? Sure. Thanks for that nice uh, introduction. Can you all see my screen all right? Okay, we are at bluegrassfoundation.org, and this is the, the website of the IBMA Foundation, which is the philanthropy that supports programs that foster the growth of bluegrass music. And we specifically work in areas of education, literary and academic programs, uh, history preservation, and arts and culture, but mostly education, mostly for kids, not always just for kids, but mostly for kids. Um, it grew, uh, the IBMA Foundation was originally called the Foundation for Bluegrass Music, and it was created by IBMA uh, when I was on staff there and when Greg Cahill, I think, was probably on the board at that time. I know he was um, in 2007. And so now we're known as the IBMA Foundation. And I just wanted to show you where a couple of things are on our website real quickly. I know we're probably rushed for time, but if you go to scholarships, grants, and awards, um, here's a section on mini grants, which is Bluegrass in the Schools mini grants. And currently we just have $5,000 budgeted for mini grants a year. So that that is not that many 500 grants. And so we're constantly looking for sponsors and contributors because, you know, people who can make donations and include us in their plan giving uh, in their wills and uh, things like that so that we can grow this program. We would like to help more schools, more organizations. There's an application form. Here's some pictures of some some things that uh, some groups we've done this for this is one of our oldest it is our oldest program, I think, isn't it, Greg? Um, 
let's see, project grants we give out once a year, and these are usually $2,000, um, You can put a group of many grant programs together, or Bluegrass and the Schools programs together, and, and uh, create a project that would be funded by an annual project grant. And I think uh, Annie did that with the creation of her program not too long ago. We have a number of college scholarships and uh, the Fletcher Bright Memorial for Young Musicians right here on the left is for students who are 21 and younger. And those have been ranging from $500 to $1,000 per student to help kids um, be able to pay for uh, going to a bluegrass camp, take lessons, uh, fix up their instrument, buy some educational materials, that sort of thing. Um, most of these for college students. Um, the Arnold Schultz Fund, of course, is the initiative that started the, during the pandemic, the summer of 2020, and it's to encourage people of color to get more involved in bluegrass music. And along with the, the organizations that apply for grants, I see Dave Howard is on the call today from the Louisville uh, Folk School in Louisville, Kentucky. He's one of our recipients, as Jam Pack is, um, and Giselle. Um, we also have individual Arnold Schultz uh, grants, so we can help individual people out. Um, over to resources, I think somebody's already posted this tab already. Um, in the past, we've done a lot of teacher workshops to uh, to, to educate teachers, you know, uh, public school teachers, private school teachers, homeschooling parents, uh, people, leaders who work with youth groups like scouting and things like that um, about bluegrass music. These usually work best when they're co uh, collaborating with a, a bluegrass festival. We, we had one in Bell Buckle, Tennessee a couple of years ago. Haven't had a lot of these in recent years because things have changed a bit in the schools and, and how they do things. And, and um, But uh, they were very popular for a long time and it's something that we could roll out again. We have uh, lesson plans for several years. We had a lesson plan contest where uh, teachers who use bluegrass music in some way, whether it was science, math, English, history, whatever, uh, could submit a plan and win a cash prize. And all those are listed on this page. We have a Bluegrass in the Schools uh, coloring book. We had the Discover Bluegrass um, DVD that Austin was sharing with you before. It's not clicking right now. Here it is. So this is available through our website here. Or you can also just do a Google search for uh, YouTube and IBMA Foundation, and you'll find all those um, those things too. Uh, we have a list of higher education programs that we know about at colleges, you know, where you can major in bluegrass or minor in bluegrass or where they've got a bluegrass um, performing ensemble. We have, we sponsor the Bluegrass College Band Showcase every year, every fall at World of Bluegrass. And we usually have around 13 or 14 different college bands that come and perform for us. We learn about more every year. And the last thing I wanted to show you here is camps and workshops. And so if you know of a bluegrass camp or workshop for any age, you know, for children or adults, please let me know about that. We list them here for free. And uh, just because that's a question that we get a lot, you know, where can I go to a camp to learn more about bluegrass music? So, um, I guess I would be happy to answer any questions that you have. I'm, I'm uh, thrilled to see the interest in updating the Bluegrass in the Schools Implementation Manual, which was created in the 90s, probably the mid 90s, I think, wasn't it, Greg? So, you know, it was time for an update. We haven't used it for years, maybe decades, you know, so it's, it's great that we can roll it out again and update it and uh, happy to have the enthusiasm and the help. So uh, do you guys have any questions for me? Thank you so much, Nancy. Um, sure. I think we can open this up to a broad discussion. Um, okay. We applaud all of the work that you've done over the many years that you've been doing it. Um, sure. It is tremendous and um, uh, want to make sure that all of the folks on this call get an opportunity to have a group discussion. If you have any questions for Nancy via the IBMA Foundation, we want to give mad props to Lee uh, and Worth at the Leadership Alumni Association for hosting us today. Um, that's just been a tremendous um, dot connecting exercise. 
And I want to thank my fellow panelists for being here, making time for this. If we can connect the dots, we can have a more full picture. Um, and so tying together the foundation with the class of 2023, with the Alumni Association, it was definitely my interest in just giving people a comprehensive overview of what bluegrass education does and how it does it in all of the different parts of our organization. Do you guys have any questions? If I could say yeah. one more thing, I wanted to give a shout out to Sam Blumenthal, if you'd wave Sam. He's a member of the, the IBMA Foundation Board of Directors over in Charlotte. And Yana Mojan is one of our committee members. So thank you, Yana, for helping out. I have one quick question, Nancy. Uh, to, to access the Discover Bluegrass uh, YouTube uh, videos, do you have to go to the foundation website or can you just go to YouTube for that? Uh, you can do either one. Either one. Okay. Yeah. And Great. we also have some new educational videos that are called Bluegrass Stagecraft 101 that are on our YouTube, YouTube channel. And it talks about how to do things like stage management, working with the sound man, um, you know, kind of behind the scenes sorts of things in bluegrass other than playing on stage. Thanks. Uh-huh. I'm going to drop something in the chat um, that we want to have uh, folks just have the ability to add names to. Um, if anybody's looking to add performers or resources, um, we're collecting that and then vetting those sources right now. This is a partial list um, that was put together by Brandy Waller Pace in the class of 2023. A little bit off topic, but if you're looking in the chat, um, if you have anybody you want to add to this list, you can email me directly um, and we'll be vetting those and working on the online portion of this with the IBMA Foundation's blessing and of course submitting those to them for their consideration. Any other discussion? Um, Austin, will you let us know when that is scheduled so that all of us at World of Bluegrass can come and experience the next event? Um, I would love to see how the work that the class of 2023 um, takes shape and kind of follow up on that. And um, I am going to turn things back over to Lee um, for your closing remarks. If we don't have any other questions, I'm going to drop my email address in the chat because getting a comprehensive list of um, performers and resources that do teach and offer clinics in bluegrass related um, public school and private school offerings is um, a huge project and one that began um, recently, but will continue to grow. That's gonna be an ongoing list of folks. Um, All right. Well, my thanks to Annie and to all our presenters today, and all of our uh, everyone who who joined in today. What a what an impressive group! <laughs> and uh, you know, th this is yeah. Okay, y'all have made my day. Hope hope this has made everybody else's day as well. Um, again, thanks, and um, this will conclude our our the last in our series of virtual workshops for the year. Um, we'll get the recordings up on. Um, on our web page here fairly soon. The, I will say there's an awful lot of resources and stuff going on in the chat. Um, and I put in, if you didn't see, if you want to save the chat, take your cursor over to the chat where, like where you would type a message. And then if you move it over to the little three dots at the top and click on that and say, save chat, it's going to save it to your computer. Wow, who knew? Who knew? Mm -hmm. Now you have to go find it on your computer. I cannot help you there, but it's there. It's there. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lee. That was my, I cannot lose this chat. <laughs> um, very excited. Want to give a last thanks to Greg. Thank you, Austin. Thank you, Giselle. Thank you, everybody who cares and loves about this music and wants to see it grow under this wide tent model of bluegrass. Thanks to Lee and Worth for um, hosting us and Nancy for coming in to represent the foundation. Takes a village. Here we go, village. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
Quell 10 on the nose. Look at us doing it. <laughs> wow. Sweet. Austin, okay. I would love to follow up with you on the work that you guys are doing. My dissertation topic is identifying barriers that people face when trying to teach non-traditional um, modes of string education in the public schools. And the way that um, some of this has come up is very interesting and how they navigate those barriers. So well, that's great. Yeah, we're going to be doing it at the the Tuesday morning masterclass, which is normally a one hour session uh, by the last bluegrass leadership bluegrass class and then i think two hours for other past classes or just general things but we yeah. have uh, established as the leadership bluegrass class like a good solid two-hour chunk actually because we want it to be um we want it to be round table we want people to be participating in that and we'll just keep building that list you know bigger and bigger and get it out there awesome i have a question go ahead sorry about saving the chat because I missed so much of this. I went, I went to the, I held my finger on it, but I didn't see any three dots. I'm All on right, my Lu Lucy, I will send it to you. Uh, send I'll send it to, it to you. Don't worry right. about it. Okay. Thank you. Will you All send right. it to me right. too, Lee? Will you send yep. it to me? I'm just heading into that yep. old part of life where I don't follow these things. Yep. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you so much, Lucy. It's good yeah. to see your face too for a minute. Yeah, good to see you, Annie. Good, good to stuff. see everybody. Yeah. So, just... Matt, you can go ahead and stop the recording if you yeah. will. Per, uh, yeah. Stop recording. Okay. Oh, maybe I can stop the recording. Yeah, I have that option. I'll too, see. Sure, you want to stop recording? It's at the top. That was an Annie. 